Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is April 15th, 2016, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, wars and rumors of war. The United States and Russia play a dangerous game of cat and mouse on the high seas. Meanwhile, North Korea attempts to fire a missile from its eastern coast. And a drone attack during a Little League baseball game. Well, that's the scenario for a mass casualty exercise. Plus, the social justice warriors unite to take down Donald Trump and the First Amendment. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. You are definitely hey, on the wrong side. I was just saying, you're just And we begin tonight with some rather tragic news. There has been an earthquake in Japan, and we see the article, Japan earthquake, tens of thousands flee in fear after aftershocks and volcanoes. They say a total of 44,000 people have been evacuated. This is as of last night after a magnitude 6.4, I believe it's uh, rated higher than that now, earthquake collapsed buildings and damaged other infrastructure. There are also concerns about volcanic, volcanic activity after the wake of the quake. So we will bring you updates as this evolves. As of right now, they said they aren't anticipating any large tsunami fallout from this, but you know, these stories always continue to uh, perpetuate. So we'll let you know if anything else develops on that front. Now, something that's been long developing here in the States is the issue of what to do in the wake of Sandy Hook. Now with this story, I'm gonna try to be as polite and professional and everything as possible because I know this affected many people Personally, also it affected the nation as a whole, and I guess the world as a whole, and it's the issue of what we can do to combat gun violence. Now, I don't think there's anybody who debates that there is an issue with gun violence, but I also recognize there are many other types of violence, if not negligence, whether you're talking about uh, drunk driving or you know the reports talking about you're more likely to be hit by a, a hammer and die than be killed by a fully automatic rifle in this country. You have to take all these things into account when you look at things like this. And the article says, judge allows Sandy Hook families to sue Remington firearms over massacre. In what is being referred to as a landmark ruling, Superior Court Judge Barbara Bellis denied a request by Remington Arms Company, Bushmaster, and others to dismiss the suit submitted by 10 Sandy Hook families. Asserting that the court has the proper jurisdiction to hear the lawsuit, Bella said that federal protection of lawful commerce in arms act, that's quite the name, which ordinarily shields firearm companies from legal liability does not meet legal sufficiency to nullify the claims made by the families. Now, as I was saying earlier, when you talk about anything, whether it's a car accident, a shooting, anything else, I don't think it's right to blame the manufacturer of a product that was working uh, properly in its function. And, and let me elaborate on that. If a car is defective, if the tires blow out, if the power steering goes out, or any number of other things that could go wrong to make the car crash, yes, that is the manufacturer's fault, but somebody using a firearm in its unintended use, in its illegal use, to uh, kill several children, that I don't think is grounds to sue the manufacturer of the firearm. Uh, it's a very tricky thing. You know, if somebody drives drunk on the side of the road, like just happened here in Austin, I believe it was South by Southwest two years ago, a guy got drunk, drove on the sidewalk and hit a bunch of people. Let's say if he was driving a Chevy car, I don't think Chevy should be held responsible for that tragedy. You'd take uh, issue with the person who did the atrocity they're in. Same thing with what happened in Sandy Hook. I don't think it's Bushmaster or Remington or anybody else's fault that somebody decided to use a firearm in a school that day. I, that just makes absolutely no sense to me. I understand the families are seeking closure, but I don't think this is the proper way to go about it. Uh, suing a company for making firearms is not really the right way to go about it, in my personal opinion. There are many people, many, many people who disagree with me, uh, but you know they're welcome to their points of view and all, like I said, I try to be very respectful to the families, but uh, suing the company is not 
going to do anything. Uh, as we've always documented, long before people had firearms, they were killing each other with sticks and stones and arrows and hammers and uh, the reports about how you can you know, fall off a ladder and crack your head open. And there's many other ways to die uh, that don't remedy the situation by simply f uh, suing the person who made the uh, instrument therein. I'll move on to another topic now. And let's talk about some uh, foreign hostilities. Recently, we had some Russian planes that were flying over U.S. Navy ships. And this is at a time, you know, we've seen the situation going on with Syria and Russia saying, hey, if you guys continue your presence here or continue to try to do things, talking to the United States, uh, we're going to have to get involved, said Russia. And now we see that Kerry is saying that the U.S. Navy destroyer could have shot down the Russian warplanes. And this was Secretary of State John Kerry. He said Thursday, the U.S. Navy ship that was buzzed by two Russian warplanes in the Baltic Sea this week could have opened fire under U.S. military rules of engagement. And this is the USS Donald Cook. It was conducting flight operations with a Polish helicopter Monday when two Russian Su-24 attack aircraft came within 1,000 yards of the destroyer flying just 100 feet off the ground. The following day, a Russian jet came within 30 feet of the destroyer, but the article does point out that the planes did appear to be unarmed. And why Russia would do this in the first place is beyond my comprehension. Uh, they know how high the tensions are, so why they would fly a plane uh, within 30 feet, the reports say, of the destroyer itself is just silly. Uh, had they shot down the planes, I really wouldn't have blamed them at all, to be quite honest with you. Uh, luckily, nothing more serious came out of the situation, but hopefully people will act more responsibly as things go on, not to say that everything happens responsibly on our side, but uh, better ways can be found to uh, do whatever the Russian planes were doing instead of just buzzing the aircraft. And that's just one thing. We also are having tensions with North Korea, and South Korea is reporting that North Korea had a very unsuccessful launch, is pretty much uh, pretty accurate to what that picture is, uh, shooting their firecracker uh, ICBM, I believe that's the correct acronyms. They say, if the report is true, this is the words of a CNN correspondent, and the mobile missile launch attempt did fail, it would be a major disappointment for the North Korean regime because it happened on the most significant holiday of the year, and this is the Day of the Sun, as they call it, the birthday of Kim Il-sung, the founder of North Korea. A U.S. defense official said a North Korean missile launch had failed at 4.33 p.m. Eastern Thursday after the U.S. Strategic Command Systems detected and tracked the attempt. At this time, there is no evidence the missile reached flight, a U.S. official told CNN. So try, try, try again. They have been trying for quite some time to get a intercontinental missile to go out there <laughs> over the waters, but that just is not working for them. I'm not sure what exactly they're trying to do. I know they're trying to, you know, I guess, boost up their uh, street cred, for lack of a better term, in the international community. Uh, going about it this way is not the way to do it at all. And now a lot of people are saying that the young man that's being held hostage, or I guess prisoner more accurately, in North Korea, the American man, is just basically a political pawn. If you guys don't know, we did a report a few weeks ago about a young college student who went over to North Korea and tried to steal a poster from, uh, I, I believe it was a hotel. Uh, he tried to steal some propaganda poster and they gave him 15 years hard labor. And it reminds me of that movie just came out with, uh, was it Tom Hanks? the uh, Bridge of Spies, where they had uh, the Russian spy or whoever he was in, uh, in holding in case they needed to trade him for a political favor later. And I think that's a similar thing that North Korea is doing. They're using the young man as some type of political football, advertising the fact that he is doing hard labor. So if they do need to strike some deal with the U.S., whatever, they have it there. But uh, other than that, North Korea is just up to the most silly of shenanigans. It's also, I think it was last week, or maybe it's two weeks ago, uh, North Korea was saying that its citizens basically needed to eat grass. They said, dig up plant roots and eat those because we're running out of food. Meanwhile, Kim doesn't look like he's missed a meal in quite some time. And these are just the silly things that go on if you have a communist socialist uh, regime. So all you guys out there who think socialism is the greatest thing since sliced bread, do you really want to live in a country uh, where you have to eat grass, they jail college students for stealing posters, and they're going to watch you starve to death while your supreme leader is, uh, you know, uh, eating fat at the trough. That's what some people want. Now, let's talk about what I want. I want to see the Hillary emails come out in spectacular fashion. 
But until that day comes, we do have a transcript of her conversations concerning Benghazi. Now, for you guys who don't know, which I'm sure you do if you watch this show, but just in case you're a new viewer, um, the official statement from Mrs. Clinton and many other people in the U.S. government concerning the Benghazi attacks of September 11th years ago that killed Ambassador Stevens as well as some uh, operators overseas was that an anti-Muslim film, I believe, called The Innocence of Muslims got the people in Benghazi so, bad that, so mad that they stormed the complex, uh, killed Ambassador Stevens, and got in a firefight to kill some contractors, CIA contractors. That sounds highly and improbable, because if you think about that, that's like getting mad about a South Park episode and going out and killing a bunch of people, but that's the story that they had at the time, and they pretty much stuck to it. And now we see that's not exactly the case, because Mrs. Clinton herself knew about it at the time that she was lying to the American public. And we see the transcript obtained by a Freedom of Information Act request by Judicial Watch details a call immediately after the attack between the then Secretary of State and the then Egyptian Prime Minister. We know that the attack in Libya had nothing to do with the film, quote, Hillary Rodham Clinton. It was a planned attack, not a protest. The Prime Minister responded, you're not kidding. Based on the information we saw today, we believe that a group that claimed responsibility for this is affiliated with Al Qaeda. And this is in direct <laughs> contradiction to what Mrs. Clinton has been saying for what, the past uh, however many years it's been since the Benghazi attacks. They had enough time to make a movie about it. Uh, so, so for all these years, it was anti-Muslim film. They dragged the guy out in retaliation for this, you know, pretty much live action South Park film, The Innocence of Muslims and Killed Ambassador Stevens. Meanwhile, she's telling people, you know, immediately after the attack, this is an official correspondence with the Egyptian prime minister saying, hey, we know this had nothing to do with that stupid movie, but we're just going out here and lie to the American public. Now, even with this information, it's a great report by, I believe, Steve Watson put this out today. This is a great report, Steve, but in the, a world where you could pretty much have her on videotape saying this, you know, holding a newspaper from the day that it was recorded, doing all these things to timestamp it, I still don't think anything would happen to this woman because if you dare try to bring up anything about Benghazi or anything else, uh, any of the other shenanigans of her political career, you just hate women. You are a sexist. Uh, you don't want to see a woman in the White House. That's pretty much how people are going to spin this in the annals of history, even though we have it right here. Transcript, Freedom of Information Act. Good job by you, Judicial Watch, for obtaining this information. Hopefully something happens with it, but honestly, I don't think anything will. Now, with these next stories, I wanna be very careful. I wanna say from the forefront, I'm not expecting any type of terrorist activity to happen anytime in the near future that I'm aware of. With that said, I also am going to point out that they are training for mass casualty events, very similar to, you know, if I talk about something like Rex 84. I'm not saying martial law is imminent. I'm not expecting it next week, next month, and next year, anything else. I'm just saying that in 1984, they thought martial law was such a real probability that they ran scenarios to conduct it here in the United States of America. With that said, they are running a mass casualty exercise at the Little League World Series. Once again, this isn't fear porn. I'm telling you what they're doing. The United States government is taking this serious enough or the perceived threat of terrorism serious enough to run the drill at the Little League World Series. That's my disclaimer. An annual exercise for emergency responders in the area scheduled for next week will be based on the scenario that seems to be out of a science fiction movie, a drone attack during the Little League World Series. The mock attack Thursday will be based on a scenario in which drones disperse a chemical agent over a crowded stadium, uh, followed by more drones dropping explosive devices as fans rush to the exits. Once again, I'm not saying this is imminent. I'm saying this is what they're training for. And if they are training for this, they s perceive this as being a real enough of a probability. So take that as you well, and we also have a similar report coming out of Coachella. And with this, they document all the numerous attacks that we've seen, whether it's San Bernardino, Brussels, the Paris attacks, all the things we've seen here recently. And they say, like any large or iconic event, the annual festival sells almost 100,000 tickets for each of the two weekends. Experts say it could be a potential target. And they went on to say, we are adequately staffed to handle any situation 
that may come upon us during the festival season, said Sergeant Dan Marshall. This festival takes almost eight months to prepare for. We take world events into account, I guess referring to the recent San Bernardino and uh, Brussels attacks. So I'm just saying that's what they're training for. So you take that as you will. Now, something I think is a sign of the times, you know, my sign of the times segment. Deutsche Bank is now admitting that it has rigged gold prices and agrees to expose the other manipulators. So basically, they uh, decided to turn against the precious metals manipulators of the cartel by first setting a long running sil silver price fixing lawsuit which in addition to valuable monetary considerations said it would expose the other banks. So basically it's kind of like those mob movies you see where everybody in the mob knows it's up, the jig's up, but you know, some guys are holding firm, you know, like, no, nah, I ain't no squealer, but Deutsche Bank is squealing loud and proud and like a canary. And they're saying basically uh, we'll give up everybody else, but you, it's kind of like that scene in uh, what's it? The second Batman movie. They get the, the guy from Hong Kong and he's like, <laughs> it's exactly like that. He was like, Hey, I'll snitch on everybody I've been working with, but you let me keep the money. And they said, okay. And that's pretty much what's happening here. Uh, this was confirmed moments ago when Reuters reported that Deutsche Bank has also reached a settlement with U.S. litigation alleging the banks conspired to fix gold prices. In other words, hours after admitting it was rigging the silver market, it did the same for gold. But, you know, they're going to, uh, I guess, ride off into the sunset. And very quickly, Greenspan blames old people for banker-destroyed economy. Basically, uh, Greenspan is saying that we need to cut the benefits to the elderly, veterans, love cutting veteran benefits, and also government employees, but they completely ignore the fact that it's bankers like him and his buddies that destroy the economy to begin with. So that's it for our segment tonight, but stay tuned right after this break. We'll have more special reports. Our guys are out in the field going to these various protests and demonstrations and documenting all the violence. Stay tuned. All right, going to our guest for the balance of the hour, Colonel Rob uh, Manish has an uh, amazing background. Retired from the Air Force four years ago for serving his country, 32 years, including in combat. He commanded a B-1 bomber squadron. Well, those are neat planes. In Iraq and Afghanistan's wars, commanded the sixth largest Air Force base in the world and served as an advisor to the Joint Chiefs of Staff following the 9-11 attacks. He helped author the plan for international war on terror, Colonel uh, Manish. Um, well, just so, so much other stuff he's done. It'll take too long to go over it. Uh, but uh, Colonel Manus is also responsible for authoring three pages in the Nuclear Black Book that travels everywhere with the president. His military awards and combat decorations include the Legion of Merit, the Bronze Star, and the Air Medal. And it goes on. Uh, Rob completed his undergraduate work while attending night school at University of Tampa and holds three master's degrees from Harvard University's uh, Kennedy School and the Air Command and Staff College and the U.S. College of Naval Warfare, robmanus.com. But it's spelled Manus. So it's Rob, M A N E S S dot com. Rob, M A N E S S dot com. Colonel Rob Manus joins us now via Skype. Thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me on, Alex. And my mother thanks you for reading that bio. We really appreciate it. <laughs> well, it's a great bio. Man, those are neat planes. <laughs> they still haven't retired those yet, have they, with the whole swept wings and everything? No, they haven't retired them. As a matter of fact, uh, we had just brought them home and replaced them with B-52s uh, in the uh, air attacks on the Islamic State uh, over in the Middle East so the B-1s could get some much-needed upgrades. Uh, they had been carrying the workload for the airstrikes against ISIS since the beginning of the the, uh, the uh, bombing operations against them. I ought to interview sometime just about those. I mean, I've seen them fly yeah. over in Austin on 4th of July. It looks like a spaceship, even though it was made in the 80s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, very fast. Uh, there's nothing like uh, going supersonic speeds in an aircraft that's the same weight class as a DC-10. And those fly super low. I mean, you can fly really low with those, right? Absolutely. Uh, the automatic terrain following system can take you down to uh, 250 feet uh, okay. at uh, approaching uh, supersonic speeds. So Do they all have the escape a, pod and stuff? No, their uh, air crews are in ejection seats uh, in the B-1 bomber. Did, and Didn't uh, it previously have like an escape pod or something? The original design did have an escape pod in it. Yes, it did. Now talk about, oh, I'm sorry, let's let's get into the campaign and why we need you in the U.S. Senate. Well, you kind of hit on it uh, in the intro and in the videos, especially with this this Nye fellow. Uh, look, Alex, I'm, a, I'm just a normal, red-blooded American uh, that uh, cares about his country uh, and is just tired of seeing the republic torn down. And and uh, we take an oath to the Constitution of the United States. And uh, I'm disappointed in men like General Wesley Clark, who who say that that folks that care about the Constitution aren't loyal to the United States. He's he's lost track of 
of what we are about. What we are about in this country is about uh, the natural rights that every human being has and the limited government that the Constitution is supposed to construct uh, uh, for us that gives everybody uh, the ability to hold themselves uh, and their children accountable, uh, to be fiscally responsible, uh, and ensures equality of opportunity for all of us, regardless of where, how we were born or, or where we came from. Uh, and uh, Mr. Clark, unfortunately, seems to think that we owe allegiance to the government of the United States. Well, that's just not true. We owe it to the Constitution of the United States, and the government that's currently in place in the United States of America has completely outgrown the Constitution of the United States, and I'm running for the United States Senate uh, because I believe in those four things that I just told you, and we've got to get our country back into a constitutional form of government. Tell us about the policies, what you would do if you get in the U.S. Senate, and obviously I'm supporting you over the people you're running against. Uh, I mean, how do we help get you in there? Because I know that we've got a good shot at it. Well, first of all, it's foreign policy. You know, uh, look, I I have 32 years in the Air Force. I graduated from the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. I studied international security and foreign policy there along with domestic politics. I'm a graduate of the U.S. Navy War College in national strategy. And I believe in the Constitution. I'm a constitutionalist. I believe in pro-America foreign policy, not pro-UN foreign policy. That's just absolutely crazy. We've got to protect America's citizens and vital national interests before we do anything else. We've got to do things like insist that Congress uh, executes its appropriate role in foreign policy and declaring war and those kind of things. And I don't believe in going into every little dictatorship and toppling those guys and creating chaos around the world. We've done that way too much. Uh, and we don't want to sacrifice our children's lives uh, unnecessarily, the ones that volunteer to defend this country. And I have three sons in the United States military. My young, youngest one that's in is an airman, and he's on his way back today to the United Kingdom, where we just rolled up uh, some more terrorists, uh, including the one at the airport just down the road from where he'll be landing tonight or, or in the morning. So we've got a lot of stake here in wow. this country with our, our kids putting their lives on the line for us, just like I did for 32 years and my dad did. So we've got to make sure that we're not out there toppling dictators and getting involved unnecessarily in these countries and protecting America's interests. Sure. What do you think, Colonel? America's interests. What do you think? Again, Senate candidate Colonel uh, Rob Manus joining us, robmanus.com. What do you think Obama's thinking when they bring in hundreds of thousands, it's hundreds of thousands, millions into Europe, most 80% are military age men, they're already doing sleeper attacks, a lot of experts believe they're planning a jihad Tet offensive in Europe. What's going to happen when thousands, conservatively, and that's what most experts agree, at least 10,000 just operate and start killing everybody and blowing stuff up and, and attacking nuclear plants, uh, they're already having guards getting killed, disappearing. What's going to happen to the government when it when this happens and they brought them in, are they so dumb that they think we won't uh, that they won't get in trouble? I mean, I'm just wondering why would the socialists like Merkel and Hollande and Obama want to be doing this? I, I mean, why do they ally themselves with radical jihadis? We know they were backing them before in Syria, but the military said no to it, and the people said no. So now they've been forced to counter Islamic State. Uh, I mean, what's going on where the Russians start to look more like the good guys? And I'm not defending what, you know, what the Russians do. They have a lot of problems. Yeah. But, but that's how bad Obama is, in my view. Well, we've got to remember that his goal is to transform the United States of America. And I truly believe that he believes in his heart of hearts that American foreign policy and the foreign policy of Western Europe uh, is the evil, has contributed and caused all of the evils of the world, uh, which is absolutely not true. Look, we're weaker than we've ever been. We no longer lead, uh, and the world's on fire. Uh, we need to stay strong, uh, and we need to lead in the world. But that doesn't mean that we need to go putting our kid and military forces uh, into all these countries and intervening where it's not appropriate because our interests aren't at stake. We've got to make sure we're defending America's interests first. Look, uh, you know, your question reminds me of the border situation in our own country, uh, and you kind of touched on the Border uh, Patrol admits security. that they quote complete the smuggling process. Our own reporters two years ago, Jakari Jackson, Don Salazar, Absolutely. went down yeah. the border, Colonel, and the and the the Border Patrol admitted we're ordered to bring the illegals in and give them vouchers and complete the smuggling process. I mean, just just backing you up. How do they search me when I fly in? You know, from Europe, search my bags, but then illegals just walk in. My son flew home on leave uh, 
uh, from the United Kingdom a month ago on the same day that the Brussels attacks occurred, uh, and he was on an American Airlines flight. And before he even got through security, he had to answer 32 specific questions uh, to uh, just to board the flight to the United States of America. So we've got a problem. And part of the problem is that we have folks that are in office right now leading this country, and it doesn't really matter what letters behind their name. You know that, Alex, and that's why, uh, uh, you know, uh, our, our presidential candidates on the GOP side are so popular, uh, the two front runners are, is because they believe in Americanism. We believe in Americanism, our sovereignty, our sovereignty. It's, it's simple. We must respect our own laws. That's all we ask for is that other people respect our laws. And we've got to do two things when it comes to things like internal security uh, and immigration control. We've got to do two things is all we've got to do to get things on the right track. And that is secure our border, secure our darn border, and get ourselves to, to make ourselves enforce our current law. Our current law is not being enforced. And if we enforce current law, just on the Mexican side and the Central American side alone, the illegals that are in this country, uh, uh, there's pew polling out there, that data out there that shows that even, and it was taken during the Obama administration, that even during his administration, upwards of 1.2 million people would go back to their homes in Central, South America, and Mexico a year if we would just enforce our current law. I mean, my goodness, what's wrong with respecting American law? It is the law of the land, this thing we call the Constitution of the United States. What do you think the, the president is, rights. is thinking, Colonel, when the border's basically wide open and then th there will be more terror attacks? They ordered the FBI, as you know, mm -hmm. to say San Bernardino wasn't, but two days later it came out it was, and the FBI leaked that they were ordered to say it wasn't. There's got to be a major disconnect there. <laughs>
bad boys. We need a thousand Paul Revere's. Revelation the movie. Dot info. No is a powerful concept. Forty-four thousand plus people have evacuated the Japanese town of Mashiki on the southern portion of the land of the rising sun following a 7.4 magnitude earthquake that has killed at least nine and injured 858. If you have been paying attention, you may have noticed the frequency of earthquakes being reported in 2016 has been unyielding. Recently, a magnitude 6.5 earthquake hit Vanuatu. A magnitude 5.9 earthquake hit the southern Philippines. A magnitude 6.9 earthquake rocked Myanmar, and on April 10th, a 6.6 .6 magnitude quake hit Kabul with aftershocks in India. On April 8th, there was a magnitude 4.2 earthquake in Nepal. Nepal was also hit earlier with a large 5.5 magnitude quake on February 22nd. And in the beginning of 2016, on January 20th, there was a 6.1 magnitude earthquake in China. And 16 days prior, 11 people had died when a 6.7 magnitude earthquake hit Manipur in India. Michael Snyder of End of the American Dream writes, Why is the crust of the earth shaking so violently all of a sudden? Seismologist Wilhelm of the University of Colorado has made headlines all over the world by warning that current conditions might trigger at least four earthquakes greater than 8.0 in magnitude. If his projections are accurate, our planet could be on the precipice of a wave of natural disasters unlike anything that any of us have ever experienced before. Basically, what we saw in Japan earlier today is tiny. Compared to the destruction, Bilham has been desperately trying to compel governments all over the globe to be aware of. But Bilham has been turned away from at least one country that refused to hear the truth. In 2012, Indian officials deported Bilham when his plane arrived in New Delhi. Why? Bilham had raised concerns about the dangerous seismic activity in the Jaipur region where a nuclear plant was being planned. Meanwhile, authorities are quietly racing to monitor the many volcanoes blowing their tops. Currently, there are 38 active volcanoes as the Earth moves through its volcano season. The WorldNet Daily writes, There is a 5% to a 10% chance in the next 80 years, scientists say, one of these eruptions will kill millions of people and poison the atmosphere beyond the imagination of anything man's activity could do in a thousand years. And no one is yet making any plans to deal with the calamitous possibilities. But earthquakes are earthquakes, and uh, I don't know. Hopefully, we just won't ever have to worry about it. How does that make you feel, living here and running a business here? Um, it just feels kind of awkward. I uh, didn't know about that fault. Uh, we've had earthquakes here in the last two or three months that weren't as big as this. Uh, but uh, I'm just happy that I have a, a building that I know that can withstand it. This relatively unknown fault line that was here, and you can see where the road has just separated into. It was pushed up against each other directly in this area. Sidewalks are about three feet high in some places. True to California fashion, some of the children have seen this as their opportunity to have their own makeshift bike ramps and skate ramps trying to make the best of this situation. All eyes should be on the ring of fire as the trenches activate the tectonic plates at exponential levels and earthquake news events multiply. John Bound for Infowars.com. My first time being a delegate. Let me, let me get a shot of your delegate. Uh, Hatch, right here. Also, um, at the assembly, they were handing out these little um, these little pamphlets, mm -hmm. and it had like the um, instructions for the ballot with the numbers, the names, and who they pledged to. Um, but there were a number of people that they had left off the list um, that we had to write in, and it was very confusing. And like I said, the time for check-in was um, 
was very confusing so that we all ran over an hour and a half over and people were complaining because they were going to have to leave for work without being able to cast their vote. So when this story first came out, um, a lot of the mainstream media was saying, you know, these people, Colorado people were sour grapes, you know, they just didn't understand the process. But it looks like from, your, from what you're telling me that things were being changed and manipulated as the process went on. Yeah, um, actually in my precinct, even though there weren't many um, people that, that attended or knew to attend, which seems like the GOP didn't advertise it on purpose, but the majority were Trump people, actually. But we ended up sending, I think, two others as crews and me being the only Trump because we just didn't really, I guess we didn't understand the process and we picked the candidates before knowing who they were voting for because the guy who, the old timer who was explaining it, didn't explain how to do the precinct for our, our invis our individual precinct very well but it was at the it was the phone calls the emails that confused me at least to where I was unsure for a long time as to what time I was even supposed to check in and apparently from what I heard on email conversations the guidelines say that you're not supposed to have check-in before 8 a.m. and they had our check-in at 6 30 a.m. so apparently there was some rules that might have been broken <laughs> That's awesome. And joining us now is Rob Dew. What's the situation, Rob? Well, Jakari, I'm here on location at the Capitol in Denver. This is the Capitol building, Denver, Colorado. I'd say maybe 150, maybe 200 people here right now pissed off that their vote was stolen. I have a delegate here with me, Doug Merrill. And he's going to explain what happened uh, in the process, right? Doug, so tell me what happened. Sure. Uh, on caucus night, uh, we had 16 people from our precinct uh, show up. And out of the 16 people, we had six people for Trump, six people for Rubio, and we had four people for Kasich. Ted Cruz was not even considered in, in our precinct. We elect the delegates, of which I was one of the delegates that was elected. Then I go on Saturday and March 19th, we pick up our cards over here and, and, and we show up, we get there at 7.30 in the morning, we leave at 3.30. We get a lot of signatures for people who want to vote for us and vote for the Trump party. There was a movement of never Trump going around in there and my vote, as was all of our votes, completely disenfranchised out of Colorado. I, I'm really angry as a, a lot of people should be. America is about your vote, not about people selecting a vote for you and we're tick off and i've never protested before but i'm mad as hell and the mainstream media is making it seem like you guys are calling sour grapes y'all didn't understand the process did you understand the process yeah i fully understood the process and we were disenfranchised someone made the decision i received an email saying i'm no longer a delegate but i received an email that i could be considered as an alternate this is completely wrong before i would previous election with Mitt Romney, I was a delegate, and apparently my vote was counted then, but in this election, it isn't, I, I am for Mitt Romney and I am for Donald Trump, but I mean, the individual vote should be counted, and we should go to a primary where we just cut all this nonsense that you can debate whether it's an open primary or a closed primary, but let's just get, we, the vote of the individual should be counted, not someone who's sitting behind a closed desk. Yeah, a club behind secret emails and secret lists. And Absolutely. We, we were completely disenfranchised and all the people who were for Trump that I know of were all knocked out. And it's just simply wrong. It's just not American. It was systematic whack-a-mole, I guess. They found a Trump supporter. They'd whack him out. Yeah. And, and I had more signatures. I lobbied. We went around. You go around and you collect signatures on it. I had more signatures than anyone else. And look up my name and, 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 and then have them answer to why I was knocked out. That's that's absolute evidence right here. All right, Doug, thanks for speaking out. I got another delegate over here. He's got a nice shirt. <laughs> Very bright. What's your name, sir? My name's Julio Rodriguez. All right, and so you said you were a state delegate? I went to state. I was one of the top delegates, not only out of the precinct, um, but out of the county as well. Mm -hmm. So I was there on Saturday when we did all of this process. All right, so what happened? Well, I think the most important thing is, what, something I wanted to tell you is the Hispanic community is not dead to Trump. Yeah. I'm a Cuban-American. My grandfather came here from Cuba in 55. 
fought in the Bay of Pigs, was a prisoner of war for two years. So I don't think that America's dead and it's it, or that, that the minority community is dead. And you have to understand the Hispanics are what the Republican Party has always wanted and what the Democratic Party has always thought they've owned. We're, we're no longer a part of that. We're starting to wake up. Right. Because a lot of a lot of Republican values. And I, I would I, I tell you, first off, I'm not a Republican. I'm a libertarian. But with what's going on with Trump, I see the system attacking him on both sides, which is making me want to support him at this point. Well, I mean, you know. I'm a Republican because it's, it's the biggest platform I can speak on, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think Trump is is resonating with a lot of people because a lot of people don't understand what it means to fund your own campaign. When you fund your own campaign, how important that is. A lot of the American people don't understand how much how much power not only your donors give you, but your supporters and things like that. So Trump is an independent in that regard. Um, but I, I don't see this election going any other way than Trump. And I just noticed something too. You're a you're tatted up right here and a, and a GOP. So we the people tattooed, man. We the people. Look at that. Get a shot of that right there. Yeah, we the people. And then I brought my delegate badge with me so you guys right. can see that. Yeah, Julio Rodriguez, State Douglas delegate. delegate. Yeah. Uh, again, I was I was the top delegate coming out of our precinct, top delegate in the county. Um, there was a big Never Trump movement there that we saw. Um, again, it was just. The fact that we only had, and I wrote it here on this sign, we only had 10 seconds to speak. So 60% of the people there were unbound delegates. That would lead me to assume that 60% of the people there were like, well, we don't know who we're going to vote for. Let's listen to all of these delegates and see who we like, who can who can speak our voice for us. We only had 10 seconds, man. 10 seconds? We only had 10 seconds to speak as delegates. So there was a line of about 600 people, and I only had 10 seconds to, to have people trust me as saying, hey, I'm the future right. of this party. Yeah. Give me an opportunity to go to Cleveland and represent us, the people. And we never really had that opportunity to do that. Now, are you planning on going to Cleveland anyway and follow what Roger Stone's doing with the Stop the Steal movement? I don't know if I want to go into all that. I mean, I think with this whole process, I think it's kind of reinvigorated me to run for Congress maybe okay. and be a congressman one day. But uh, as far as Cleveland goes, maybe we'll see you guys there. All right. God Thanks a lot. You Were you a delegate, sir? Yes, I am. All right. Well, come on over here. Come step down right here. Thank you. We're getting everybody's stories here. Tell me what happened. Uh, my name is Dr. Jim Eller. I'm a retired professor from Metro State University. Okay. I'm also a libertarian. Mm-hmm. Uh, Republican Party offers me a place to vote. Right. And the thing that's most disturbing is March 1st, tens of thousands of Trump supporters went to the caucuses where they learned for the first time. This is something that the average voter doesn't know. They learned for the first time that they couldn't take a vote. And if they did take a vote, it wouldn't count. What Reince Priebus calls a beauty contest or a straw poll would have about evenly split between Trump and Cruz. Now, here's the tragedy, and I'm a political rhetoric guy. The tragedy is that had this thing been up and up, Cruz would have probably won a primary by uh, maybe even as much as 10 percent of the vote. And this thing would be history and would be behind us. But when you work behind the scenes and you spend months setting it up so that the person that majority of the ordinary new voters like Julio and others we've heard from don't get a chance to speak. Those people are resentful and they're angry And, And and it could break up the party. Uh, I think the party's finished. As a libertarian, I wish my party, the Libertarian Party, was stronger. I wish that its message was clear. But this message ought to be clear. We need a third party. We need a new party in America that gives the people a chance. And it starts with a primary. Hell with the caucus system. We need a primary. Yeah, um, they say 30 percent of Bernie supporters will not vote for Hillary. And 30 percent of Trump supporters will not vote for anyone else but Trump. That could be the makings of a new third party. Well, I hope that if they do try to jerk it around, now I think Trump's going to win. I think he's going to get over 1,300 delegates. Uh, I think what he can do, because he can appoint the next chairman of the RNC, that he puts the RNC instead of back in Washington, D.C., where it is now, but maybe some podunk village in the United States, uh, don't fund it. Don't pay for Reince Priebus. Don't pay for any of those people. And most importantly, kick out the lawyers of the RNC because they're the ones that figure this thing out right, and right. try to set the strategy. Uh, this has been going on for decades, but I I really believe it is time for a third party. And here's what we get if we get a third party. We can start over. We can run down welfare. We can take away food stamps. We can close the borders. We can stop the, uh, I don't like to call it illegal immigration. Let's just say there are a lot of people who have no right to be here. And so what we want to do is we don't dislike people, but they have no right to be here. We have 25 million people who are not U.S. citizens on some type of federal support or state support in this country. And it has to come to an end. We can't afford it. Yeah. Where's the money coming from? Uh, Where's the money coming from? (laughs) Right now, it's uh, quantitative easing. It's coming out of your pocket. Yeah. It's not coming out of anybody's pocket. They're making it as they go. It's monopoly money. 
exactly. And that's why the they're charging his interest. Formed, by right. the way. Yeah. They formed when Nixon was president mm -hmm. because of the money problems, and we're right there again. Only it's worse. Right. Well, Jakari, let me tell you, it has been really refreshing to see all these people out here. Big InfoWars fan. Actually, uh, a lot of InfoWars fans. I did a, uh, uh, they had me come up and speak. And at the end, everybody started chanting InfoWars. So a lot of support <laughs> here. A lot. I see a Hillary from Prison t-shirt. This young man here has got a Hillary from Prison t-shirt. See that? Yeah. A lot of people just walking up to us as we were coming up. I couldn't even like start filming people were coming up to me so i just started interviewing them left and right so it's amazing to see this kind of support we saw a lot of the same support in new york last night people just stopping on the street infowars we heard you were here we came out to see if it was true and uh i think a, a couple came up earlier they're like you're actually a real person so yeah we are real people and we're out here you know fighting you're not some figment you're people. not some figment of people the, don't have uh, a voice internet. do they Jakari? yeah well i think this is exactly what people want they want to know that uh, people actually care about what they have to say and they see you guys uh, you and big out there and it gives them a chance just like you said to speak your mind like had we had we not sent a crew out there i never would have heard the stories of the delegates themselves and just right. like you said they keep trying to make them sound like they're crazy they don't understand the process those gentlemen were very well spoken they seem like yeah. they know exactly what's going on they just didn't have a chance to have their message heard Exactly. The mainstream media was making it seem like these people had no idea what they were talking about. The system was already set up. You're just sour grapes, you know, and these people are genuinely pissed and they genuinely think that their vote was stolen. We're about out All of right. time. Just tell us uh, your next stop on your trip here. We're leaving tonight, going to Portland. We'll get in at midnight and we're going to be there tomorrow facing off with the social justice warriors at Portland State University who don't like free speech. So we're going to go there, maybe hopefully educate a few of them. And if not, we'll let the chips fall where they may. This is Rob Duke signing off for InfoWars.com. Well, that's it for our show tonight. I'm Jakari Jackson from the InfoWars Command Center, and we'll see you again next week.